the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. Welcome to the Bitcoin Group, starring Andreas Antonopoulos from Root11.com. Hi there. Megan Lords from Bitcoin Not Bombs. Hello. And I'm Thomas Hunt from Mad Bitcoins. Hey, Bitcoin Group. <laughs> What do you think Alpha Lion Technology does? Well, if I had to guess, Alpha Lions uh, usually use urine to mark their territory. So I'm going to go for a wild guess here. They sell urine that allows you to keep uh, household pets off your property. <laughs> Megan? I'm going to go with a less creative response. I hope they're working on another exchange or some Bitcoin ATMs or something. That would be cool. Alpha Lion Technologies. Find out what they do at alphaliontechnologies.com. Issued one. Bitcoin aid to the... the hell? This is our last week's. Great. Issue one. Technical difficulties at the Bitcoin group continue. We load last week's. Very exciting. Let's see. Can we stall during this exciting interruption? I had it before. Let's see. It's going to look good on YouTube. Issue 1. Bitcoin aid to the Philippines. No NGO or third party needed. The people are simply organizing themselves with worldwide donations in Bitcoin. Is this the future of disaster relief? I ask you, Andreas Antonopoulos. Absolutely. Now, this is very much in keeping with the overall spirit of the Bitcoin economy, which at its heart has shown to be a, a sharing economy and a gift economy. The predominant use of Bitcoin has been charitable giving and gifting among people. And that's really exciting because altruism is something that is being expressed through Bitcoin on a daily basis. Uh, disasters like these allow us to bring instant uh, relief by transfer of value uh, very quickly to the people who need it directly on the ground and certainly I think increasingly we're going to see NGOs use this and then eventually we're going to see direct value transfer to to the people of an affected disaster area if they can already use Bitcoin in their environment. Megan? Yeah, absolutely. I love what Free Aid's doing uh, with this project. They're matching uh, a ratio of one to one in Bitcoin donations uh, when you donate, and I think it is going to set the standard for nonprofits and charities. Uh, a lot of it because due to transparency. I have a whole list of things that they've bought with the bitcoins here. I mean, 3,900 cans of sardines, grits, tarps, nails, candles, medical supplies, ropes, hammers, blankets, cooking cooking pots, tree saws. I mean, they're, they're documenting everything, and I think it's going to become the new standard. You can see exactly where your Bitcoins are going, and you know exactly what they're being used for. And if other charities don't step up, I really think they're going to be left behind. What I was really impressed by a free AIDS campaign was uh, Rahim, who's in charge. He's just a normal person organizing his neighbors. And he said, you know, do you want someone to come in and lead this, or should I just take it up and we'll do it? And it seems like they're separating the supplies, putting them on boats, taking them out there themselves. The charity is getting done, and there's no one else needed, no one else involved other than the people who are in the area. Yeah, I actually got a quote from one of Raheem's friends who said, I trust you more than any government or nonprofit organization. So, yeah, it comes down to individuals being able to help other individuals uh, without government interference. I think the last uh, 20 years has shown us clearly that decentralized disaster aid uh, through uh, many, many organizations working in parallel on the ground and specializing in particular niche operations like medical supplies or finding people or, uh, you know, providing food, etc. Uh, those work far better than large centralized hierarchical disaster relief. So decentralized disaster relief works better with a decentralized currency. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Exit question. Is this the Christmas of Bitcoin? Will the Salvation Army's bell ringing Santa Clauses take Bitcoin this winter? I ask you, Andreas. 
Well, I certainly hope Black Friday is going to be Bitcoin Friday, where we decide not to buy plastic crap and instead invest our spare cash in Bitcoin this year. And uh, yes, I would like to see more charitable donations over the Christmas period go to uh, needy people with Bitcoin. Why not? Again? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, I, I think we're seeing a new standard being set here with charities, and you have to have incentives for these things too, and I think these other charities are going to be looking at, you know, what Free Aid's doing, and Bitcoin Not Bombs, and Sean's Outpost, and they're going to say, hey, we need to, you know, get on this. So I, I hope it's going to be a Bitcoin Christmas. Issue 2, Bitcoin 400. As predicted by Derek J on last week's show, we had a bit of a correction, but it was far briefer than many thought. And now we seem to be on the way back up. What's causing this crazy run-up? Will it ever stop, Megan? Will it ever stop? <laughs> I hope it does kind of stabilize a little bit more. I think we're seeing a lot more interest generated in it uh, from all over the world, uh, especially in places like China where you have large populations of people. Um, and I've been just hearing uh, more of uh, my friends talking about it who aren't into cryptocurrency and don't really know about it very much. They've been contacting me like, how can I get into Bitcoin? What's happening? What's it doing? You know, what is this crazy thing? So uh, yeah, I, I think we're just seeing a lot more interest in it. Despite all the negativity, I, there, there's a lot of negative uh, articles out there saying, oh, you know, it's only used for drugs and prostitution and stuff like that. And uh, what we do with Bitcoin Not Bombs, we try to show that, no, I mean, it can be used for charity. It can be used for all kinds of things. I bought some grass-fed beef and pasture-raised pork today from a local farmer with Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we are going to see an increase, but uh, I think, you know, stabilization is good for a currency because you don't want something that's going to be rapidly changing. So I, I think uh, for its purpose as a currency, uh, hopefully we'll see a little stabilization. And it seems like we have over the past couple of days. Andreas? Uh, I, I see that uh, Bitcoin is going to end up in either the zero uh, category or in the hundreds of thousands of dollars category within the next three years. I have no idea how it's going to get there and how many bumps and rides and the ups and downs we're going to have before we get there. But those are the two possible trajectories for Bitcoin. It really doesn't have a midway, uh, easy, slow growth pattern. It either dies because of a fundamental flaw or a fault in the uh, system or external attack that is successful, which quite honestly is unlikely, or it survives. And if it survives, it thrives and explodes across the globe in patterns of adoption like we've just seen with China, and it is heading to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and there's nothing weird about that. It's not a stock. It's a currency. And soon we'll be talking about micro bits, uh, because uh, talking about Bitcoin uh, will really m not make much sense. Absolutely. It's already become a lot better to think in um, hundred thousandth, so that if you had one Bitcoin, you'd have a thousand Ringos, because this makes you much richer when you think about your money. You're a, you know, a couple thousand Ringos ahead. Well, right now, today, uh, one dollar will buy you about 300,000 Satoshis, and I think that is a really good value uh, for your dollar, and it won't last. Uh, I would like to see a site that records the exchange ratio inversely like that. One dollar buys you 300,000 Satoshis today, but watch it drop. And that will more accurately reflect the uh, essentially your your purchasing power decreasing through inflation and a currency that is under crisis. Yeah, I was just about to mention that we need to start think we need to change our thinking about what Bitcoin is. I mean, the dollar is a dying currency. I mean, it's been propped up for a very long time artificially, and it's just not going to last. And I really see Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies in general being the future of money, and they're not ever going to go away. So and the other 192 currencies are doing worse and racing each other to the bottom even faster. So whatever it means to us here and the rest of the world, Bitcoin is the lifeboat that allows people to escape the sinking ship of their local currency. Exit question. Will we see a $1,000 Bitcoin by year's end? Yes. I think it's very likely, yes. Yes. Hey, Andreas, have you heard about Biddylicious? Biddylicious? Megan. Biddylicious? <laughs> Biddylicious? 
Yes, of course, bitty, bit, bitty-licious. Buying Bitcoins can be delicious. Buy your Bitcoins today at bittylicious.com. Issue 3. Bitcoin exchanges hacked, closed, and vanished. Are Bitcoin exchanges safe? Should Bitcoiners just keep their Bitcoins on paper with a key in a safe deposit box rather than on an unsafe exchange? I ask you, Andreas Antonopoulos. Yes. <laughs> yes, all the exchanges are unsafe and should be avoided like the plague. Uh, basically, any online wallet that has the keys that you don't have or has the keys that you have but they also have them is dangerous. Any system that you access over the internet where you have to type in passwords that can be captured by a keylogger are dangerous. We have had three and a half million years of experience with physical security from the first time a caveman hid a squirrel under a rock so the other caveman wouldn't eat it. We have had only 50 years of information security experience and we suck at it. Most operating systems are not suitable for storing your nude selfies, let alone your entire fortune. So get that money offline as quickly as possible. Get it off the exchanges, put it in private encrypted wallets on your own computer, and then put most of it in paper wallets. Megan? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, I also work at Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, which is a precious metals broker, and one of the things we always tell people is, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And that very much applies to exchanges. And I mean, I, I think exchanges might be good for keeping a small amount of uh, coins in there for trading, but like Andrea said, you want to put that in a, a wallet, you know, an external wallet that's, that's backed up through encryption or even the paper wallets. I mean, you, you want to make sure that you have full control over your, your cryptocurrency. It's true. Many people haven't even heard of paper wallets. So let's take, just take a minute to say, if you print out the public and private key onto paper, send bitcoins to the public key, keep the private key private, your bitcoins will just wait for you in the blockchain until you come back with the private key. Here's a paper wallet. This is what it looks like. It's a piece of paper. It has your keys printed on it. You can get this for free. You can download the software from a number of different places, including safepaperwallet.com, which is a business I started, where you can buy these pre-perforated and pretty printed ones. But you can also use the software to print it for yourself on your own color printer. This is the most secure way to store your Bitcoin. You can even encrypt it with a private PIN or password, so even if you have the paper, you can't unlock it. And best of all, these all come with a secondary stub, which allows you to tear off a second copy of the key and put it in a safe deposit box. That way, you can back up your money. Now, there's something you can't do with gold or paper money. Yep, that's that's the best approach. He he said it right there, and that's something that uh, I've been meaning to do. I have been kind of putting up. It's like I, I'm going to be doing that very soon, getting my own paper wallet. So yeah, and I mean, it's uh, the great thing about Bitcoin too. It's so portable. You know, if, if you needed to leave the country with your bitcoins, you could totally do that. It's not like lugging around a bunch of silver or gold, and you know, have, I mean declaring it to customs and stuff like that, like, forget about that. I mean, you have it all, you know, as long as you have that paper key, I mean, it's there, so. Exit question. Which of today's exchanges will last the test of time? None of them. <laughs> well, I was hoping to see, you know, better, more secure ones coming out. I, I think as demand kind of increases, I think the market's going to... Uh, provide better exchanges, but again, the, there's always going to be a security issue with the exchanges. So, yeah, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Listen, if Bitcoin succeeds, it's going to be traded on every foreign exchange market in the world, and these little piddly exchanges that are providing a bridge service will be bought out by the big exchanges so they can get a jump start on the technology and teams they need to understand cryptocurrencies. They will have a very comfortable and nice exit but uh, these companies will not exist in a year if we do things right because we will be able to trade Bitcoin on any of the exchanges that currently uh, do currencies. Moving on. Issue 4. Bitcoin goes to Washington. As Bitcoin prepares to face regulation, its toughest challenge yet, will congressional pressure break the back of Bitcoin? Or will Bitcoin just keep going and going and going? Megan. 
Uh, you showed the honey badger. I mean, Bitcoin is the honey badger of money. It doesn't give a bit. So, yeah, I mean, Congress can try to stop it, but there's no stopping it. They'd have to shut down the entire Internet, and at this point, I mean, there's too much invested in that. I, I don't see it going anywhere. I don't see other – I think other cryptocurrencies are probably going to, you know, rise so, so people can use them too. But, uh, but yeah, I, and the thing is, I mean, the, there is some talk about, well, you know, let's just comply with the regulations with Bitcoin and we can, you know, we'll make it we'll make it friendly for for your average person. Um it's not a law that's going to do that. It's not any any Congress or any any lawmakers. It's going to be doing what Free Aid's doing and Sean's Outpost is doing and sh saying like, "Hey, you know, you can use these bitcoins for good." And it, the Bitcoin community is very generous, and that's what's going to bring Bitcoin around uh, to your average person. It's not going to be, oh, well, they're complying with the regulations, so I guess they're legit. So I, I don't think there's any reason to, uh, I, I mean, there, there is always kind of a concern, you know, when the government's involved in trying to control something. But Bitcoin, by its nature, is it can't be controlled, so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to dignify our current government with a serious response to their attempt to regulate a cryptocurrency. These are the same people who allowed the top six banks to steal more than two trillion dollars less than five years ago and are entirely impotent in their ability to prosecute any of these thieving bastards who are still occupying the top echelons of the executive offices of Bank of America, of Citi, of JP Morgan Chase, of Wells Fargo, and all of those other banks. These are the same banks that rigged the LIBOR. These are the same banks that rigged the gold markets. These are the same banks that have rigged every single fucking financial market in the world and are still walking around free. They stole trillions and they're not in jail. And you want to regulate Bitcoin? Well, I have news for you. Fuck off. That's what Bitcoin says. You made a really good point about the incompetency. I mean, these are people who can't even make a website. I mean, how are they gonna, how are they going to regulate Bitcoin? Our government is a wholly owned subsidiary of the big banks. They don't operate independently. They don't have oversight. They do not regulate the big banks. The big banks are above the law and they own the politicians. So when the government comes to regulate Bitcoin, I know who's behind it. Those who don't want competition for the banks. They're not here to protect the consumer. They're here to protect the banks from competition and to ensure the consumer will never have an alternative that they control. And we will not let them do it. Right. Absolutely. Exit question. Will Congress tax Bitcoins? Yes or no? <laughs> they might try to, but <laughs> good luck. No, I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, Congress is already taxing Bitcoins as far as the IRS is concerned. Barter income is income. Income is money is income. Non-money is income. Currency is income. Foreign currency is income. Anything that you can tax is income. I pay sales taxes and I pay income taxes on my Bitcoin and I will continue to do so. And, and that's my choice. But uh, for the long run, certainly government has to adapt. Uh, to a currency that cannot so easily be controlled in terms of taxation. Now this is nothing new. Uh, before the last 30 years we didn't have trackable currencies in the way we do today and they still manage to tax people so I don't see a problem. And now it's part of the show where I ask you to tell the future and predict something. Are you ready, Andreas Antonopoulos? We're already seeing some major attacks against Bitcoin. I was expecting that Bitcoin neutrality would be under assault. I didn't expect it to happen this fast. As usual, things in Bitcoin land are unfolding faster than anybody expected. So we need to refocus our uh, ideas and our principles and ensure that Bitcoin remains neutral to sender, neutral to recipient, and neutral to transaction value as it is today. Those are the powerful principles that make Bitcoin work. Megan. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're going to see a lot more outrage from the government side of things as, as Bitcoin continues to just kind of slip through their fingers. Um, and I, I think as it grows in popularity, too, you're going to see a lot more pushback. Um, whether or not they're successful with that pushback, I mean, that's that's debatable. I'm, the incompetency thing is a factor. But I, 
as, as you see more outrage about it, you're also going to see more curiosity and more people getting involved. And because, you know, people know, pe people aren't stupid. They see what's happening to their money every day. They see what's happening every week when they're going to the grocery store and, you know, their groceries are getting more and more expensive. I mean, they realize what's happening with the dollar and they realize it's dying. It's, I think it's only a matter of time before you have widespread adoption of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin micropayments will transform the world of YouTube, transforming YouTubing, YouTubing from a dead-end time sink into a job that earns reasonable income thanks to the kindness of strangers. We're not out of time, and we can't wait until next time because we've got user questions, and we have a record number of people watching us live. According to the box, we have 21 viewers. Now, Whoa. I'm going to push the Q&A button and see if anyone asked us questions. There's still a chance, if you haven't asked a question, to ask a question now. So let's see. Oh, and then the Q&A oh, box is. disappeared. Great work. All right, so we're going to start with questions that people have sent us through email and YouTube comments. E.L. Uh, Andreas says, use comment tracker. Okay. Let's see. E.L. writes, two questions for future episodes. If Bitcoin survives, which we assume, what will be the value in 2017, 2021, when the blocks contain 12.5 or 6.25 Bitcoins each? Andreas? Uh, as I said, in the three-year horizon, we're looking at uh, Bitcoin worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we will not be talking about Bitcoin. We'll be talking about microbits, if it survives. Megan? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think we're going to see it uh, go up really, really high. Um, I'm not the greatest at making predictions, so you know, don't hold me to that, but, but I do think that we are going to see a pretty large increase. The second question, try to assess how fierce the war will be on the, uh, the old economy-minded wage on Bitcoin when it reaches $2,500. Andreas? I don't think the exchange rate of Bitcoin has anything to do with uh, how fierce the war on Bitcoin will be, and uh, frankly, I'm not particularly worried. Uh, other than a few public figures in Bitcoin who may be personally attacked, the vast majority of users will be immune from such attacks, and most of these attacks will be in the public media, not through law. Uh, Bitcoin will be smeared. It won't be legislated. So I would just ignore all of these things, and I don't think the exchange rate has anything to do with it. What does have to do with it is if we start see remittances being successful, and suddenly some of the companies involved in that, like Western Union, start feel threatened. Uh, when we start knocking down the dominoes of the old economy, that's when they start reacting badly. Megan? Yes. Yes, especially as it gets more decentralized, because you are going to see some some of these companies being attacked. Um, you know, especially if they're in the the greatest thing about Bitcoin is it's so decentralized. You know, you don't they're not like printing bitcoins in a building somewhere that you can go and take down. Now, some of these other agencies involved, you know, they do have establishments that could be raided and and you know their their files taken and things like that. But you know. It, and even if you do see something like that, Bitcoin's only going to become more decentralized and it's still just going to slip through. Um, so yeah, there may be individuals targeted, there may even be some organizations targeted, but you know, eventually it, you're not going to have a need for those organizations anyway. Um, it, I mean, right. it, a lot is at stake. A lot is at stake with Bitcoin. I mean, it, it challenges so many people's worldview about what a currency can be and you know what the dollar backs too I mean we're talking about a dollar backing you know the military industrial complex so I, I think it's going right. to get really nasty but um, I, I think in the end you're going to see cryptocurrency prevail to, to pick up on part of what Megan said I really agree with the decentralized nature of Bitcoin I've been saying for years uh, General Patton's quote that fixed fortifications are a monument to the stupidity of man. And whenever anything fails, it's always a single point of failure. If you look at the uh, uh, Obamacare website, it failed because it's a website. It wasn't distributed enough. It's not a strong enough website. If you look at Bitcoin, it can't have the same kind of failure because they've already taken this advice into a court and they've decentralized the Bitcoin. 
Well, it started it. decentralized from the very beginning. What is truly astounding is the attempt of so many innovators who first discover Bitcoin and then decide that the best way to approach it is with a hierarchical top-down organization that is highly centralized that they'll s slam on top of the Bitcoin. And that goes for some of the user associations like the Bitcoin Foundation all the way to most of the exchanges and other businesses that surround Bitcoin. If you are doing a centralized organization around Bitcoin, and even worse, you're doing it in the U.S., well, I'm sorry. We'll be seeing you in court. It'll be interesting to watch. Moving on. Brent writes, Hey, Matt, I just discovered that you also do a weekly show called The Bitcoin Group. Keep it going. It'll catch on. I'll try to tune in live today. I was wondering if you could go over the tainted coin issue that's been all the talk on Reddit for the last few days. It would be good to understand it. I still don't think I do. And hear everyone's perspective. Cheers, Brent. Andreas, tainted coins? So here's the bottom line. Uh, in a misguided attempt to protect people against theft, some people are trying to use the fact that uh, coins can be tracked uh, across transactions to say, well, if this coin has been reported stolen, why don't we stop people from spending it later? This is a well... A meaning idea, but it is horribly misguided because it immediately breaks three of the most fundamental principles behind Bitcoin and will ultimately lead to the complete destruction of Bitcoin if we're not careful. We must resist any attempts of introducing this type of code into the Satoshi reference client. And I have made a public pledge that the day the Satoshi implementation includes tainted coins or filtering, I am selling all my Bitcoins and moving them to an altcoin because that is the day that Bitcoin died. Uh, listen, the moment you start doing something like this, you break the three principles. The first principle is fungibility. Fungibility means that any coin is equally worthy as any other coin, and you should not be able to distinguish among them in a transaction. This has been litigated as far back as 1700 in Scotland, when someone tried to mark notes and then claim that they had been stolen, and the courts came back and said, no, you can't do that, because then it would force every bank to check every note against the stolen note registry, and that would make the currency unfungible. And now we've already done that in real currencies. We cannot do it in Bitcoin. It would destroy the value of Bitcoin. The second principle it destroys is the principle of counterparty risk. At the moment, transaction in Bitcoin is between sender and receiver. There is no other party. As long as the sender has a valid output and the receiver has a valid key or a verification token that can be used to validate that transaction, that transaction is redeemable irrevocably redeemable. No one can stop that transaction from being redeemed. If you add a blacklist, that blacklist is your counterparty risk, and that counterparty risk will be able to stop the redemption of a transaction. Um, furthermore, if that counterparty actually tries to taint the coins of anyone who's actually powerful, then immediately they will fall on their face, get sued, and now you will have another counterparty, the US courts. So I can guarantee you that if we do tainted coins, HSBC's money laundered coins won't be tainted. They get away scot-free. The kid who bought some weed with Bitcoin, his coins get tainted. But more importantly, environmental activists, anti-war protesters, anti-capitalist protesters, you want to send money to WikiLeaks? Forget about that. They're going to be on the list. HSBC will never be on this list. So this tainting of coins will break our no counterparty risk principle. And finally, Bitcoin is neutral. Neutral to sender, neutral to recipient. If we add a third party in the middle, Bitcoin is no longer neutral. Now, every transaction has the possibility of a veto by an unaccountable, unelected organization. We just broke consensus, people, and that's why I will walk away from Bitcoin the moment that happens. Yeah, from what I understand, right now uh, they're kind of proposing it as something you can opt into. Uh, and I think it's kind of a way to kind of make it uh, appear, oh, well, it's all squeaky clean for people who might be concerned about people buying drugs with Bitcoin. But I, I think you can see a good analogy with this in anything that, you know, any organization or government tries to regulate. You, you can try to regulate it, but it's just... It's like regulating drugs or trying to regulate guns. There's always going to be a black market for it. And, you know, I think while the intentions are good, it's not going to be very effective uh, because, like Andrea said, you're attacking the fundamentals of Bitcoin, and that's why people got into Bitcoin in the first place, because of its, its decentralized nature, because there's no middleman involved. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, 
right now, from what I understand, it's an opt opting in kind of thing, and I don't really see how it's going to be effective because I don't see how people are going to join in on that. I, I think it's kind of a a move to make Bitcoin, you know, kind of like have a sanitized version of Bitcoin, but the people who are already using it are not going to opt in. They're not for it. This puts the levers of control right at the core of Bitcoin and allows a third party to pull that lever as a veto. And make no mistake, it will be completely ineffective in stopping theft because thieves yes. can use remixers, they can use anonymizers, they can use a thousand tricks to launder that money before it is effectively stopped. Uh, just like they do with electronic transactions and credit cards, which are far more controlled and reversible and where blacklists and anti-fraud schemes exist. Make no mistake, this will be used to build the great fire wallet of China so it can keep out dissidents. It will be used to suppress any opposition in any government that does that is uh, authoritarian or totalitarian, and it will not succeed in protecting anyone from theft. All it will do is destroy Bitcoin. As a Greek, I can tell you, when you see a wooden horse outside your gates, burn it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there, there's... <laughs> It, 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 yeah, there there may even be good intentions there, but uh, yeah, it's just it, it's a I think it's a terrible idea. It, you're you're basically giving someone the right to say, oh well, this is theft and this isn't theft, and it gets into this really you know kind of morally dubious area. And I mean, you, no no one can make those de decisions you know fairly. The courts will. The courts will because as soon as you try to taint someone's coins and they have the amount of money needed to go for legal recourse, they're going to both sue the people who tainted their coins and they're going to essentially invalidate the tainting system because then people will be forced to accept tainted coins by a court. Well, yeah, that, yeah. So you just added the entire baggage of the existing financial system right back into Bitcoin. We've seen this happen before. You want to make PayPal nicer for consumers and nicer for banks, and eventually it becomes the PayPal we know today, which is why Bitcoin is replacing it rapidly. Uh, we cannot yeah. appease the thieving bankers. They will not stop. This is not about theft protection. This is about power and control. Make no mistake. We have to stop this. And a note on PayPal, I, I was speaking with Teresa Warmke of Free Aid today, and she was mentioning uh, that they're having a hell of a time with PayPal right now. Of I mean, course. It's, it's, it's a nightmare to work with, and there are people dying. You know, there, there are people who, who are in dire need of help who can't get the funds because PayPal is screwing around and, you know, yeah. They're tainting the funds and they're using blacklists, yeah. exactly what we are proposing to do to Bitcoin. And guess who they're using it against? Wikileaks and activists yeah. and charities. They haven't used it against a single bank. Oh, by the way, those are the people who stole $2 trillion. Yeah. I don't think so. Moving on, Danny Z writes, Hi folks, I like your channel. I would love to hear your opinions on the idea of decentralized autonomous corporations, DACs. As a generalization of cryptocurrency systems that can be applied to companies, enterprises, and institutions. Andreas? Uh, DACs are a fascinating concept. One of the interesting aspects of Bitcoin that's not often discussed is the fact that it separates personhood from ownership of assets. Whether you're a person, an individual, or a corporation, which is a uh, fictional person under law, uh, you have the right to own assets because of that personhood. Uh, under Bitcoin, you don't have to be a person to own Bitcoins. As Ro Robert G. Brown said, on the blockchain, no one knows you're a fridge. Uh, Bitcoin allows autonomous software agents to own and uh, spend assets of their own volition without uh, any oversight by a human. That means you can actually have software that sells and buys bitcoins, that buys and sells services, that pays for its own hosting to keep itself alive, that propagates and evolves independently with its own bank account. Uh, some of these applications will be bad, some of them will be viruses. But I also think that we are going to see things like autonomous altruistic organizations, essentially software agents that collect charity money and distribute it at very, very low cost based on keywords of disasters that they see around the world. Uh, we can see tipping agents that try to reward good behavior on the internet autonomously, like an altruistic virus. So we, we're going to see all kinds of new evolutionary behavior and species of systems that can now use money. 
it's really uh, revolutionary stuff. One parallel is that Bitcoin itself is a digital autonomous corporation. It is a corporation with shareholders but without owners. It is a corporation that is not registered any in, anywhere in the world but exists only as a network. And I predict that Bitcoin, if it succeeds, will become the first digitally autonomous corporation and also the first corporation with more than a billion shareholders. Megan? I, I think with a rise in the autonomous corporations, you're going to see a rise in autonomous communities, too. Um, now, I'm not as well versed uh, with the autonomous corporations, but something that's happening in Pensacola right now is Satoshi Forest, which is a nine-acre uh, piece of land that Jason King of Sean's Outpost purchased, all with bitcoins, that's going to be used as a homeless sanctuary. But it's not just going to be a homeless sanctuary. Uh, there's going to be um, permaculture techniques incorporated, food forestry, aquaponics, alternative energy means, and it's going to be a cryptocurrency-based autonomous community that people can go to for safety and also uh, hopefully eventually to, to be trading and to be self-sufficient. Um, I think as things collapse more around us, you're going to see more of a push for self-sufficiency. And it's great for Pensacola because what they've done in Pensacola is they've outlawed homelessness. Uh, I mean, they're taking blankets from homeless people in Pensacola to enforce this ordinance. And it, it's really sick and it's really terrible, but the people have pushed back against it and Satoshi Force is a big part of it. I've also heard of another project, uh, another attempt to do this in Arizona, I think you're going to see a lot more of these projects popping up, and I think you're going to see people, you know, opting out of the currency system that we're in with the dollar and into something like uh, a any of the other altcoins and, and more into self-sufficiency. I think we're also seeing a couple of other examples of that where uh, communities of a common interest and autonomous communities uh, which perhaps came from hacker spaces or other areas are gradually adopting Bitcoin and becoming uh, autonomous communities with their own uh, currency capability. Uh, one example is Calafu in Barcelona, the other one is Macau in Milan, and I'll be visiting Macau in Milan uh, in order to attend the first Dark Wallet hackathon there uh, with a, an incredible group of Bitcoiners who are uh, writing code. Uh, to fix some of the issues around privacy and anonymity in Bitcoin. That's a perfect example of a physical space that acts as a community of common interest for Bitcoiners. Very good. Well, we're running out of time, but I wanted to close with this comment that Wayne90079 sent us. Wayne says, Bitcoin is an ET algorithmic trading tool to empower 99% of the world's population towards a better future. The algorithm plus liquid redundant components of it at the moment are all part of the self-aware, intelligent alien design to wear, react, grow, and protect its integrity. Only in the future will humanity realize the importance and savior that Bitcoin is. I have this on very good authority. We're out of time. Bye-bye. <laughs>